please join me in welcoming Jennifer Weiner. Well, hello. Um, it's really, really, really good to be here. Uh, I was in New York this morning, and I was on the CBS This Morning show, and um, I had to explain to Charlie Rose what the phrase catch a D means. Um, so it's all, it's all been uphill from there. But it, it was great. Like, they asked me, what? What does it mean? Catch a dick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh. So, hi. <laughs> um, yes, it's, it's the same in sign language, too. I understand. It's, you guys so much. Like, I, I love starting my book tours here because, like, it's all, like, a slide downhill. It's so, it's never as good as it is here. So, anyhow, um, that happened. Yeah. Um, so, um, so who saw the debates? Yes. Yeah, right. Okay, so, like, ten white dudes on a stage, and it's like, I hate abortion. I hate abortion more. I oppose abortion after rape. I oppose women taking showers after rape. Because they're washing that unborn life right out of their pubes and down the drain. I think we should put doctors who do abortions in jail. Well, I think we should put women who get abortions in jail. Well, I think we should execute doctors who do abortions. Well, I think we should execute women who get abortions. Well, I think we should just fucking shoot women. You know that's what they're thinking. <laughs> um, and Donald Trump? Okay, right? Donald Trump is just like, well, I had friends and they became pregnant and they were considering abortion. <laughs> but then they had a baby and it was a classy, luxurious baby. And then I saw how wrong abortion was. And it's like, okay, Trump, like, if the kid had just been, like, adequate, would you, like, still, like, support a woman's right to choose like you did for many, many years? You know? What if the kid was Rosie O'Donnell? <laughs> what then? Um, so, anyhow, um, oh, yeah, and, and bleeding from her wherever. Right? Like, Megyn Kelly was so mad at him, she was bleeding from her eyes or her wherever. And then somebody was like, what do you mean wherever? And he was like, well, you know her nose. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you don't get your period in your nose, <laughs> Donald Trump. You get it in your pussy. <laughs> OK? I'm just saying. So. Um, I, I, I got some upsetting news on the way over here, which is that Jonathan Franzen is trending on Twitter. Yeah. Um, he, he gave an interview, or no, I guess Har The Atlantic. The Atlantic reviewed his new book, which is, um, and it said, Jonathan Franzen takes on feminism and technology. Um, he's not a fan of either one of those things. Um, and evidently, there is an angry feminist character in his new book named Wennifer. <laughs> Wennifer Giner. <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. Her, her, name is, her name is actually Annabelle. But um, at, at one point, like, you know, she, she does this thing of, like, she covers herself in butcher paper and goes and, like, has a sit-in at the president of her university's office and, and believes that this is somehow political because feminism, you know, feminists are stupid. And, and then she makes her boyfriend pee sitting down because the struggle is real. <laughs> Hashtag satire. <laughs> and I'm like, no, Jonathan Franzen, no. All of us feminists make our boyfriends pee sitting down. <laughs> All of us. Like, if you wanted to be satirical, you'd have her make her boyfriend pee lying down. 
that would be satire. You're just reporting. So anyhow, I'll, how many of you are on Twitter? Are a lot of, okay, what I would like you to do is pull out your phones with me, okay? And we're, go, we're all gonna unlock them. And we're gonna um, open, get to Twitter. It's gonna say, what's happening? It's gonna be your picture, not mine. And um, we're all gonna type hashtag, hang on, I gotta get to it. That's not it, there we go. Hashtag J-E-N-W-E-I-N-E-R space, hashtag Jen Weiner again. I'm disrupting the system and you're all doing it with me. We're just gonna, we're just gonna tweet hashtag Jen Weiner until he like cries and goes away. <laughs> I'm actually doing this. I hope you guys don't think I'm kidding. <laughs> I hope you're doing it with me too. All right, hashtag Jen Weiner. I'm gonna do like three more and then I'll start talking again. <laughs> Does somebody wanna ask me something while I'm tweeting? <laughs> hashtag, my daughter went to camp and she hated it and I wrote about it for the New York Times and now she hates me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not good. It's, um, I sent her to organic hippie Jewish farming camp. <laughs> and, and we drive up and um, the, the, the Jews have, um, the men have long beards and some of the women and, <laughs> you know, they, there's like, various facial piercings and we get there and the counselors have face paint and they're like waving flags and pounding bongos and my daughter looks at me and she's like, why? <laughs> why? And I'm like, get out of the car. Like I'm laughing so hard at this point. Like this is, this is, this is my dream basically because like I, I figure like when they were newborns, like, I spent years, like, just at their beck and call, you know, like, changing diapers and getting up in the middle of the night and, like, feeding them mush and, like, taking them places and paying attention and all of that. <laughs> and, like, now they're just there to entertain me <laughs> is, is my attitude. Okay, so let me just do this a couple more times. Um, yeah, you know, I dropped her off on a Sunday, and I didn't get any letters for a week and a day, and then I got three letters in a row, and then um, the first one said, Dear Mom, I hate it here, this is hell. I'm dripping in sweat, and the deodorant you sent me doesn't work. Please come get me, I mean it. P.S. Very angry. <laughs> okay, so do you guys see what I've done here? I've hashtagged Jen Weiner seven or eight times, and now I'm going to tweet it. And if we all do this, then Jen Weiner will trend. And Franzen will be angry and have to pee sitting down. And just... So um, I was invited to be on a talk show, OK? I was um, sitting at my desk, minding my business, doing the final revisions on um, Who Do You Love? And I got a call from my um, television agent who says ABC is putting together a new talk show and they think that you'd really be great for it and they'd like you to fly to LA and do a chemistry test. And I am like, what is a chemistry test? Um, and he explains to me that there's gonna be like maybe like five or six people that they are looking at and they're looking for like a panel and they're gonna put us together and they're gonna see who gets along. And I'm like, well, I, like, I work in my closet in pajama bottoms and I don't wear a bra a lot. And um, I know on television you have to not do that and also, also wear makeup and Spanx and comb your hair. And um, you know, so I was just like, these are real lifestyle trade-offs that I'm considering here. And also the show's in New York, so I'm gonna have to like, be, on the, be on the Amtrak a lot, which is worrisome these days. Yeah, not good. So I, I'm like, you know, I'm thinking and like, do I want to do it? And I don't know. And then I, I'm like, um, you know, like 
thinking about the way Hollywood works and how it privileges the thin and the young and the pretty and the same kind of like outrageousness that gets clicks and page views online and how like being thoughtful or being, you know, having like a civil exchange of ideas is something that like works in real life but not on TV, you know, and, and like these are things I value and they don't really matter and like do I really want to do this and it turns out I do. <laughs> Yeah, fuck all that shit. I want to be famous. <laughs> um, so, I, um, you know, and, and I'm like making this good case about like visibility and like the world needs to see more plus size women and like, you know, and it's important and it matters and, but that's just not true. I just want to be on television. So, um, well, it is, it is true. It's, it's also true. It is true in addition to like me wanting to be on TV. So, um, I, um, you know, I guess that they had seen me on Good Morning America, where I was for the duration of the last season of The Bachelorette, I was their in-house bachelorette expert. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know like which of my professors at Princeton is like taking that as more of like a knife in the heart. Like Toni Morrison or John McPhee. <laughs> They're both like, we did not see that coming. <laughs> Wow, you know, and like I graduated summa too. Like I'm sure there's some people there that are just like, oh, can't she just say she went to Rutgers? <laughs> God damn it. All right, so, so anyhow, so I, I start like talking to the executives and we're like doing like these Skype training sessions and they're like, just be yourself, just be yourself. And I'm like, like I could figure out how to be anybody else. Like, you know, I'm not that talented. And so then I'm like, who else is like auditioning? And they won't tell me. It's like this top secret deal. They won't say. And, um, you know, they, they just say it's going to be smart pop culture with a mix of men and women. So I, um, I fly to LA and I do like a final sesh with one of these guys who keeps saying my name a lot. He's like, now, Jennifer, you just need to tell a lot of personal stories, Jennifer. Let people know Jennifer, Jennifer. And, and he's like, um, when you're talking to, insert name of former professional athlete, and I'm like, really? Former professional athlete is one of these people trying out for this show, and he's like, oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. And I'm like, well, just tell me who else. So it turns out it's, it's gonna be a former professional athlete, whose name I don't wanna say, and a disc jockey who has like a huge social media following, and okay, so he has like a FACO radio name, you know, like Ira and the Douche on um, <laughs> Parks and Rec. Um, I, I would call him the Douche, but I, I won't. So okay, for the purposes of this speech, the, um, the athlete and the DJ will be Choice Cut and Beanbag, okay? And um, so I get off the phone, and of course I know their real name, so I'm like Googling and like YouTubing and doing everything I can. So um, Choice Cut, I'm calling him that because he has like a, a, a nickname like that that he calls himself. He refers to himself pretty much exclusively in the third person. <laughs> um, and he's got a reality show already. He's, and he's had a couple of other, like he's been, he's been on TV a lot. He's also been like in the news a lot. And, and in trouble a lot for sort of various quasi-educational endeavors that ended allegedly with him trying to choke people that he was working with. <laughs> and he's a big guy. So I'm just like, okay, uh, thing one, be self. Thing two, do not piss him off. <laughs> oh no. Um, and so, Beanbag was interesting because he works with a genre of music with which I am not familiar. So I look him up and I, I, you know, see the pictures and he's sort of like generic hipster 101. He's got like the sharp hair and the glasses and he looks really skinny in his suit, but he looks kind of like buff in like the gym pictures that he's always posting on Instagram. Hashtag keep grinding. <laughs> so I'm like, don't piss him off either. So, um, you know, but this guy actually had like an interesting backstory. Like he was 
um, raised by a single mom, and his mom struggled with substance abuse and radio. He was one of these kids who like listened to the radio in the middle of the night, you know, and and would like call in to the DJs, and they were like his link to like a better possible future. And he always wanted to be on the radio. So I'm like, well, I'll really like him, you know, like this is like we'll we'll vibe. Like we're both like in love with some like medium, in love with the idea of like expressing ourselves and being creative and having something to say in the world. So um, yeah, that's bullshit. <clears throat> so I go out to LA and I'm like having my last like little go around with the executives and they're like, oh, you know, and, and Jennifer, meet Beanbag. And so there he is, and I'm like, oh, Beanbag, hi. I've read so much about you. I, like, YouTubed you, and I read this whole profile of you. And he, like, total blank. Like, no clue. Like, I am, like, generic bosomy female. Like, <laughs> com coming at him too strong. And he's just like, hey. And so, um, you know, I'm like, that, you know, it's so great. And you've got, like, a book deal, and you've got a TV deal, and your radio thing, and the social media, and it's really fantastic. He's just like, I'm just, I'm just out here grinding until something works. <laughs> and he looks both terrified and exhausted. And I'm like, I have finally found somebody as insanely driven as I am. <laughs> we should not reproduce. <laughs> Um, so he gives me like a, a limp dead fish handshake and mutters goodbye. And I'm like, he must just like come alive on TV. It must be like Frampton comes alive. It's probably amazing. So that night, um, okay, remember smart pop culture. Okay, we've all got that in our heads. So that night they email me a list of 30 potential topics that they're gonna like throw at us the next day and have us discuss. Um, and some of them were like Caitlyn Jenner, obviously. Um, some of them were parenting related, like, would you let your kids be on social media? No. Um, and then there's like, you know, celebrity gossip, like Sofia Vergara got engaged and Ariana Grande, Ariana Grande licked a donut. Um, so I'm just, I'm, well, a bitch needed the calories. <laughs> right? Like, let's be real. Like, she slipped her Disney chains and was, you know, they like let her out of the like hermetically sealed Barbie case where they keep her. And she was just like, food! And they were like, no! And then she licks the donut and it's, you know, probably like the first sugar she's had in a very long time. Anyhow, okay, so I, um, I go to sleep and I get up the next morning and people come and do my hair and makeup and I get in the car and I go to the studios where they're gonna be doing this whole thing. And the first person I see is this woman that I know from E. And I'm like, what is she doing here? Like, she's on E, like what? And so I Google her name, and the first thing that comes up is name of E, um, anchor, says she left voluntarily, denies feud with Juliana DePonda. And I'm like, I call my brother, who's also my agent, and I'm like, uh, she's here, and I read this article, and it says she wasn't fired and that she's not feuding. And my brother's like, fired, feuding. <laughs> feuding, fired. So I'm like, okay. So she's there, and there is a woman who used to be on The Bachelor and then was on Dancing with the Stars. So, of course, I, like, fall all over her, and I'm like, what happened? Tell me everything. Did they really, like, lock Jason Mesnick in a jacuzzi until he proposed? <laughs> and she's like, you're scaring me. <laughs> and I'm like, I am so sorry, but I must know. And so, like, you know, okay, so, so she's there. And um, there's like some CNN anchors there. There's like some other news people. Like basically, there's like 12 people. And we are divided into sort of like smart white chicks and NFL wives slash Kardashians. Like this is, this is, this is, guess which side I'm on, right? <laughs> So, I mean, um, there, there was, honestly, there was a woman who was like one of Chloe's friends who's like already in a spinoff. And, and I'm like, so what is up with Lamar? And she's like, girl, we pray for him. And I'm like, tell me everything. <laughs> and she's like, you're scaring me too. So, um, and it was like, there was like a British woman who's like a brand ambassador for wipes. And um, who else was there? I wrote this all down. Hang on, okay, so anyhow. All right, so round one. They, they put us at a table, it's sort of like the view. It's me, it's the Dancing with the Stars lady, 
it's the it's a, a news anchor from Miami who was lovely. It's a guy from E who's lovely. And they the first question is, do you consider yourselves high maintenance? And so like everybody starts talking and you know we're all like joking and they're like Jennifer and I'm like okay, I am a 45-year-old Jew. So like if there's no air conditioning, then I don't go there. <laughs> Ever? I mean, like, to me, like, roughing it is like the hotel where the room service stops at midnight. <laughs> so, um, you know, like, they, they asked us about, um, oh, and then um, for some reason the E guy started talking about, like, public toilets, like, being high maintenance. His thing was, like, he doesn't use public toilets. And he's like, I got a great hover move. And I'm like, you pee sitting down? <laughs> See, it's all coming back to Franzen. <laughs> Could everybody hashtag my name some more, please? <laughs> you can listen and do it at the same time. I'm cool. All right, so anyhow, um, so I do round one. I go upstairs, and this is when I sort of see everybody else. Um, there is like this, the most beautiful woman I ever saw. She was like six feet tall, half African-American, half Japanese with like magenta hair and lipstick. So of course I like Google, 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 and she's married to an NFL player. Um, and it says she is a philanthropist, but I can't find like a philanthropy or like any other job she's ever had. But like, shit, if I look like that, like, I wouldn't do anything either. <laughs> she had the biggest ring I've ever seen in my life. It was, Bill, where are you? Where's my boyfriend who won't propose? Hello. <laughs> Big. Big. Um, so anyhow. So they, they bring in bagels and donuts and nobody's eating them but me. And, um, <laughs> you know, and then I go outside to sign my contract and there's like one of the executives and I'm like, who is the white lady? And she like has this giant binder in her lap and she opens it up and there's tabs on each of us with our pictures and how many followers we have on Twitter, how many followers we have on Facebook, how many followers we have on Instagram, like what our like bullet points are, like I'm, I'm dying to see what they wrote about me, but I don't want to ask because I'm also afraid. Um, yeah, and, and I was just like, you have binders full of women! <laughs> That's a thing, right? Um, so, you know, I'm back in the room and I'm just trying to figure out like this weird blend of people and I am, am just like, like there's everybody here but Snooky. <laughs> and somebody's like, oh, Snooky was here for the last round. And I'm like, I'm up for the same job as Snooky. Where did I make that wrong turn in my life that has led me to this moment where I and Snooky, Snooky and I are like in the same place. Okay, so then I get called down for round two. So it's me and this woman who wrote for Saturday Night Live who is like so funny, like I, we're in love with each other, and then the guys, okay? Beanbag and Choice Cut are there. And like they're just like chatting away, they're having a great time, they're kind of ignoring us, it's a little rude. We sit down and the producer yells, okay, nicknames, did you ever have a nickname? And so, um, Beanbag tells this story about he was in junior high and he was on the wrestling team and his like singlet ripped and um, his penis was showing and then they called him T-Bone and I'm like I get the bone I think but like T and he's like I guess it rhymed and I'm like no it doesn't <laughs> dumb shit so anyhow, okay, so then, then Choice Cut rambles into this story. He's like, all of his stories begin, I grew up in the ghetto. So then I start starting my stories that way too. <laughs> Just really pissed him off. Um, but he's, <laughs> he's like, you know, I had a jerry curl and it left this big stain. So then Lakeisha and I look at each other and we both start singing, Just let your soul glow. Let it shine! <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. So, um, so we're singing and the producers are laughing and the guys are like looking at us. And so, you know, so he gets done with his story about like his Jerry Curl and then it's my turn. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I too was raised in the ghetto. And when I, when I was 15, 
my parents sent me on a teen tour to Israel. Um, yes. And so Choice Cut looks at me, he says, oh, you that privileged white girl they sent up in here. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I'm like, I, there, there are many ways that I think of myself, but like privileged white girl is generally not among them. And I'm like, you know, like maybe I was at one point, but like my dad left when I was 15 and he didn't pay his child support. We were really broke and like blank. Okay, like I, I am feeling like resentment radiating from this guy and like total disinterest from beanbag. And so like no sympathy for the five weeks that I spent like climbing Mount Masada, <laughs> all right, with six other girls named Jennifer. <laughs> and they called me Fat Jennifer, <laughs> which is better than T-Bone. Um, so let's see. Um, so we're all back in like the holding pen and I'm, I'm like befriending the CNN people. And one of them says to me like, do you notice the guys aren't here? And I'm like, yeah, they're not. Like, it's just us women. And the guys who've evidently been like picked already are off in their like private wonderland. Um, except Choice Cut has left his luggage there, which is monogrammed Choice. It was really something. Um, and, and so then one of the other, like the conservative commentator is like, did they tell you smart pop culture? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, I just got through talking about dyed armpit hair. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I got like public toilets, right? And so then everybody starts talking, like somebody's like, I got the Diddy beat down and I got sex in public places. And like, we're all just like, we all came like prepped to talk about like gun control and like transgender. And instead we're getting like donut licking and like Hugh Jackman's wife not letting him work with Angelina Jolie and like just nonsense, like celebrity nonsense. And so the point of the day is becoming clear to me and it's not be yourself and it's not tell your story. It's just like, make these two guys want to be with you, okay? I went on a lot of blind dates in my 20s. I can't do that, okay? Like, I, I can catch a D, but like, I just, <laughs> you know. Like, in terms of like professional athletes and like angry, resentful 35-year-old disc jockeys, like, I know it's not happening. I know it's not happening. And like, they're having a bromance, and we're all in the harem. Okay, we are the girls hoping the sultan crooks his finger and that we're not in one of those repressive countries that believes in female circumcision, <laughs> right? We're all just back there thinking like, please God pick me or at least don't let them sew my labia shut. <laughs> so anyhow, okay, so final round. Um, and, and like the crowd is like dwindling, the Dancing with the Stars woman like takes off her leather leggings and puts on cotton leggings and like leaves and you know, so then I go down there for the last time and it's just me and the, and the two guys. And they are talking about basketball and they do not even interrupt their conversation to acknowledge my presence, okay? So like it's bad. Um, and finally though, we get a real topic and the producer says, um, Caitlyn Jenner received the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage last night. What do you guys think? Okay, so Choice Cut goes first. He says, to me, that's not a woman. That's Bruce Jenner in a dress. And I'm just like, oh no, oh no, no, that's, that's Caitlyn. That's a, that's a different person. That's, that's who he always was. That's a woman. And then Beanbag is like, oh, I just think I was in the wrong place. I don't think the SPs were in time to do that. I wouldn't have done it there. I'm like, what? Are you on the radio? I can't even understand what you're saying. Stop mumbling, ass munch. God. And so I am like, I am, I am like making the speech for transgender rights. I am like on my soapbox and I can feel how bored they are. I can like, their eyes are rolling. I can hear it and I'm just like, and kids are dying and being bullied and we nailed Matthew Shepard to a fence and if one last kid dies because Caitlyn Jenner is up there, then that is courage to me. And like, they're gone. <laughs> They've left the stage. Like, I am, I am there, I'm just like, and the producers are like, thanks, yeah. 
bye bye so um, I think that who eventually got it was the wipe lady and um, <laughs> yeah and and one of the urban contenders urban um, yeah but like so you know I, I wish I could say that I'd learned something but like I didn't learn anything except that like Men run things and, well, at least men run that. And, but it's like, I'm just trying to think like, their whole idea is that like, they're going to capture, like there are men who are underserved in the mornings. And I'm like, there's ESPN and masturbation. So, <laughs> so no, like if a dude is home at 10 o'clock, he's happy, <laughs> happy. Right, Bill? Hello, honey. Um, okay, so that that is um, okay. Yeah, and and who do you love? It's awesome. It's it's based on this like it's based it's it's a couple and they they fall in love. They meet when they're children in a hospital. Um, there's like the rich privileged Jewish girl. You the rich privileged Jewish girl they sent up in here. Um, and the there's a, a biracial guy who's like his mom has won a radio trip a radio contest on Q102 to go to Florida. And they meet, and they have this like very tender moment, and um, then they they meet again as teenagers when they're like doing this like Habitat for Humanity thing. And in my initial drafts, they were both 17, and I had them hook up and have hot sex. And my editor was like, "No," and I was like, "What do you mean?" She's like, "No," and I'm like, "But, but," and she's like, "No," and I'm like, "The kids, you know," and she, "No," <laughs> and I'm like, "But when I was 16, she, no." And I'm finally like, what is your problem with this? And she's like, look, I have teenage boys, okay? I cannot think that this is what they're doing. <laughs> and I'm like, they might watch ESPN. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. So anyhow, so um, this couple, like, they meet, they're together, they break up, he hooks up with a model, she gets married, she has kids, the marriage ends. And so it's sort of the question of like, do these people become who they're supposed to be? And do they ever like manage to like get it right? And does he ever propose? <laughs> Cause you know the gays can marry now. You you heard that, right? So like that's not not yeah. So anyhow, TikTok. Um <laughs> And, and with that happy ending, I, will, I would love to take your questions. If anybody wants to know anything about the new book, about television, um, Charlie Rose, Catch a D, anything else you don't understand, I'm, I'm here for you tonight. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, I want to ask, you've been so outspoken about... Um, women in publishing and everything they have to deal with. And I wanted to know if you have any advice for other women starting off in the publishing industry. As writers or just? Yes, as fiction writers. As fiction writers, as writers of fiction. Um, if, if your villain's name um, is Wennefer Giner, <laughs> she's probably gonna recognize herself. So like change the names more than that, okay? Um, if you're going to write about your exes, give them tiny little penises, if your exes are men, because they, they either won't recognize themselves or won't want to say anything about it being them. <laughs> um, yeah, that's Anne Lamott's joke, I have to give credit. Um, you know, she, she's just like, that works every time because no man is going to be like, Your Honor, that character who was hung like a grape on page 134 is me! And I will show you! So, yeah. Um, but, okay, so, like, honestly, though, um, what have I learned? What have I learned? Like, if you go to jenniferweiner.com, which is my website, because I'm really super creative, I have, like, a whole, like, 20-page, like, advice for how to write a book, how to find an agent. Um, I, I haven't talked a lot about how to, like, survive the process. Um, you know, I, I would say don't ever look at Amazon. Don't ever look at Goodreads. Like, that is like the, the valley of the damned. So don't do that. Um, what else? Be generous. Be as generous as you can. Um, you know, I, there's always someone coming up behind you. 
and you want to be the one like extending a hand instead of pulling up the ladder and like slamming the trap door shut. Um, and I think any chance you have to like boost other women writers, do it, particularly on social media, because I think that there's such goodwill and such community there. Like I've seen like huge, huge, huge best-selling writers like talk to people who just had their first book published by like the tiniest publishing house and be like so encouraging and so kind because I think that like writing is lonely. Writing is lonely work. So the idea of making those kinds of connections feels really great. And people like to help and people like to be asked to help. So like don't be afraid to ask for help and be as generous as you can. And I would say like in life too, like not just publishing, but that's like good advice like in general, like just be generous, especially with food. Yes, <laughs> especially with desserts. Hi, Hi so my question is about you as a writer and as a personality here and as a Philadelphian. Um, obviously the, the library considers you a true treasure as Thank those you. of us here uh, agree. And I'm wondering, when you are doing this type of book tour out in other locations, and you are from Philadelphia, uh -huh. um, how would you describe life in Philadelphia? Or from your perspective, how would you describe Philadelphia? Or what, what reasons are there to come here? Wow, what a great question. Um, I really proselytize for Philadelphia. I love it here. Um, I came here in 1994. I got a job at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I moved to my first apartment on Monroe Street in Queen Village. And I'd never lived in a city. I'd spent, I grew up in a suburb. I grew up in a suburb of Connecticut, which was also the ghetto, strangely. Um, <laughs> it was crazy. Simsbury? Does anybody know Simsbury? Yes. Yeah, oh, you do? Really? Yeah, so you know how, how the rough streets there, right? <laughs> You know how bad it was, like those girls on horseback from Ethel Walker with their shivs, right? Like the Crips and the Bloods, only it was like Ethel Walker and Miss Porters, right? Um, yeah, okay, so I grew up in a suburb and the deal was like you had to get in a car to go anywhere. Like you, the idea that like you could open your door and be somewhere was so great to me and I love my neighborhood. I basically have spent 20 years like moving around the same block. Um, I had an apartment and then I had a house and then I had another house and so I, I love Queen Village. I love um, that there is, you know, there's a bookstore, there's a coffee shop, there's a Turkish restaurant, there's a great bar, there's Dimitri's, there's just, you know, there's Hikaru Sushi, sushi. there's like everything you could want and my kids are so much more independent than I was at that age because instead of like, you know, they, they can sort of navigate the world a little better than I could and, and they see more of what it's like. I mean, I stayed in the city for a, re a lot of reasons, but one of them was I wanted my daughters to see people who weren't just like them and to see that they're comparatively lucky in terms of what they have and to sort of understand the obligation that comes with privilege about volunteering, about working, you know, working on the political level to make changes in terms of who you vote for, in terms of what you do with your time, what you do with your money, in terms of volunteering, in terms of donating. I wanted them to know like, on not just a theoretical level, but like there's homeless people and there's people who are struggling. I wanted them to know that. And, and not that I, I want this like grim upbringing, like this Dickensian kind of, you know, uh, orphanage type thing, but they, they have their own rooms and they have a nice bathroom and everything. But I, I wanted them to like live in a city. I, I felt that was really important. So, but I love Philadelphia and everywhere I go, I'm like, it is like the best things you could imagine from New York only on a scale that you can like walk around and not feel like crushed or like just it's so crowded there I don't understand how people do it like I go a lot and it's just like there's so many people and it's hot <laughs> and the subway and it's just like I can't I can't and I but I love reading the real estate section of the times <laughs> that is like the happiest thing I do because it's like oh a million dollars for a one bedroom in Brooklyn. How's that feeling? 
come here. It's the promised land. So I love it here, and I, I talk about it a lot, and I encourage people to visit and, and move, and I think I'm probably gonna be here the rest of my life, especially if I get married, which would really be nice <laughs> someday. <laughs> Empty. <laughs> Empty. I'm gonna put like a watch this space thing like right there. Of all of my books, which part is going to be the most embarrassing for my daughters? Thank you for, um, <laughs> thank you so much for asking me that. Um, my, my oldest daughter, Lucy, is 12, and she's like, when can I read your books? And I'm like, never, <laughs> never. God, okay, there's like a blowjob in Good in Bed in like the first 10 pages. There's like a hookup in, in her shoes on the first page, right? My, my agent is here. Um, oh my God, there's the whole thing with the bath mat in Little Earthquake. Oh shit. Um, Blowjob again in Goodnight Nobody, plus premature ejaculation, plus a woman masturbating with a shower nozzle. Um, um, Certain girls, certain girls, there's a bat mitzvah. They can, okay, certain girls is good. Um, okay, but I would say, um, like, okay, so in this book, Who Do You Love? Like, there's, like, I went for it with the sex scenes. And today, Cosmo, I've never been in Cosmo because to be in Cosmo, you have to have, like, a real, like, you know Cosmo. They're like, you know, their cover is like, how to have 10 orgasms right now. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> Hey, you know, it's, this door locks. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, so Cosmo finally excerpted my book and they put it online today and it said, read this steamy sex scene from at Jennifer Weiner. And I retweet it and it said, I say, read this steamy sex scene from at Jennifer Weiner, not you, Fran, who's my mom. <laughs> right? So then I call my mom, and I'm like, you know, hey, la la. She's like, I read that thing you posted. And I'm like, I told you not to. And she's like, I couldn't help it. But then I X'd it out. It was awful. <laughs> and I'm like, how did I get here, Fran? But my mom, um, my, my mother is now, you know, of the love that dare not speak its name. Thing. She, she came out at 54, so she's like, has a, her, she has her partner, Claire, and like, but, but now it's like every time I go home, I'm just like, so Fran, what was the deal with marriage and dad? And she's like, oh, Jenny. And I'm like, no, really, I need to know, like, heterosexual sex, was it awful? And she's like, oh, Jenny. And I'm like, no, Fran, tell me, like, was every, was every thrust a stab of shame? <laughs> Hashtag stab of shame. In Her Shoes was such a wonderful movie. Thank Have you, you had um, other, other um, possibilities for movies of your books? Yeah. Do you find that you are trying to write in hopes that there might be um, another screenplay and, and movie made of it? And I guess this is three questions. Okay. Um, that's that's do okay. You, do, you, do you always have the next book in mind when you finish the one before? Okay, um, I always hope they'll make more movies. Um, they did such a wonderful job within her shoes though that I'm almost a little afraid because so many times you hear about writers who feel that their, their baby got raped basically, like to be really gross about it. Um, I did a panel once with um, three other authors whose books had been turned into movies. Um, it was me, and Claire Cook and Jacqueline Michard and Alice Hoffman. And it was a, a fundraiser for a, um, a shelter for battered women, like this excellent, excellent cause. And we, we're all getting ready backstage and the moderator says, we're gonna show little clips from all your movies and ask you a little bit about them. And we're all like, yeah, all right. So um, we get up there and they show, you know, the clip from Must Love Dogs and Claire Cook tells her story about like publishing her first book in her 50s and like walking the red carpet and that was amazing. And then they um, show the clip from Deep End of the Ocean with Michelle Pfeiffer and Jackie Michard talks about being an Oprah pick and what that was like. 
and they show a scene from in her shoes, and I talk about like my Nana being an extra and how amazing that was. And then they show the scene from Practical Magic, and it is um, Nicole Kidman and Sandra Bullock dancing in their nightgowns, singing Put De Lime Into Coconut. <laughs> and the lights come up, and Alice Hoffman says, I fucking hated that movie. <laughs> And all these like nice ladies in Chatham are like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So I, I feel very lucky. I would love it to happen again, um, but you know, like if it happens once, like that's like amazing enough. Um, do I write hoping that they're going to be screenplays? No, because first of all, I don't think visually like at all. Like, I can always hear my characters, and I always have some sort of, like, generic idea of how they look. But, um, you know, I'll turn in a draft, and my agent will be like, all of the women are blonde. And I'm like, oh, no, not again. So, you know, I just don't think of how people look, and I don't do a very good job of it. And then, like, if I wanted to write for Hollywood, like, I would never write a plus-size woman. Because there's, like, Melissa McCarthy and Melissa McCarthy, you know, and I, I, there's like, you know, I, there's just not a lot of women to play those parts, and I don't want to like pander to what I think is a really shitty way things are. I want to write characters that feel very real to me and hope that Hollywood like comes around someday. Um, and am I always thinking about the next thing? Yes. Um, like, I, right now, I'm, I'm working on two things. Um, one of them is a nonfiction collection, which I'm really excited about. Um, okay, so I'm going to market test my title. Are you guys ready? Okay, it's going to be called, I'm Not Proud. Okay, and then colon, like, adventures in, like, romance, motherhood, and breastfeeding in a sweater dress, or something like that. <laughs> I, I was also thinking of calling it Never Breastfeed in a Sweater Dress and Other Things I Learned the Hard Way. <laughs> so it might be that, or it, it could also be the F word, which was the title of an allure story that I wrote about my daughter calling some other kid fat and how I had to like handle that whole thing. And like, but my, um, my editor doesn't like the F word, is that right? She doesn't think it's gonna translate like overseas because they don't have F in their alphabet or something. I don't know. I'm not sure. There was, there was some reason for it. I don't remember. But I'm working on a nonfiction collection, and I'm working on a children's book. Yeah, it's a, a middle grade book. Um, it's called The Littlest Bigfoot, and it's about a Bigfoot who doesn't fit in because she's little, and her fur's a funky color, and she makes friends with this girl who's like keeps getting sent to like fat camp and boarding school and boarding fat camp and... Um, yeah, so it's like, it's, it's that, it's, it's that mashup. So that is, thank you. I think it would That's be really important for us to ask you your opinion on next season, if you think it'll be Ben H or Ben Z or... <laughs> thank you! Or, or the, the, the great decision of making the women choose like they did this year. Oh, God. Okay, finally we get to the important stuff. <laughs> okay, those of you who don't, like, watch the franchise can just, like, have a, have a moment to yourselves here. Think of, S think of ESPN. Um, I think it's probably going to be Ben H. He seems to be the fan and producer. He's sweet. He's cute. I like Jared. I, I know like the patchy scraggly beard was a problem for some people, but I can look beyond that into his soul. <laughs> also, I'd shave him. I just hold him down and shave him. But like, I am just finding it so uncomfortable to watch Bachelor in Paradise, which I'm now doing. But like, okay, like The Bachelor and The Bachelorette are very well-produced programs, okay? They like, they have lighting. They have, you know, sets. They send their people on like amazing fantasy dates. They make them bungee jump or they like close down the Met so they can have dates there. And like Bachelor in Paradise, like I swear to God, they're making that show on like $50 and a bag of Skittles, okay? They like got some resort in Mexico to like donate their space, but there's no air conditioning in this resort. And evidently they did not spring for sunscreen either because like by the second episode, everybody's pink, like radiantly pink and sweating, which I hate. I like can't even watch people sweat. That's how much I hate it. And um, 
but it, it's basically, it's like, you know, the dates in The Bachelor, it's like, you know, we're, we're going to send you on like, you know, the cliffs of Ireland and on Bachelor in Paradise, it's like, you know, here's like a, a, a Groupon, like go get some tequila shots. Um, <laughs> And one of our interns will film it on his phone. It's like, <laughs> I'm having a real issue with the production values. But um, yeah, I, I have to say, like this season of The Bachelorette was really disappointing because normally The Bachelorette, it's like the woman picking from the guys. But this time they had two bachelorettes and they let the guys vote on which one they wanted. Okay, so it was like, imagine like, two vans of bros like getting off the Jersey Turnpike and being like, dude, McDonald's or Burger King, All right? And they had to vote, check it, by putting their rose in one of the ladies' boxes, okay? <laughs> now let me tell you, okay, I traffic in symbolism for a living. <laughs> I think I knew what that meant, <laughs> right? But it was so degrading. It was so bad. So I'm just hoping that whatever happens this season, they're not going to ever do that again because, like, it was just very sad. It was sad for Brit. I felt for her. Um, um, my question is, uh, do you watch any of the Real Housewives shows? And if you do, um, which one do you like? And oh, which God. one don't you like? You know... And there why are, is that different from The Bachelor? I know, I know. Like, I, I'm, I, am, I am a big, like, bag of hypocrisy. Because, like, I was going to say something about, like, there are depths to which even I will not descend. But it's not, I'm watching Bachelor in Paradise. Like, who the hell am I? I just, I, I watched New Jersey, and honestly, I was horrified that, there, that um, Teresa's kids were in it. Like, that bothered me, because my kids were that age, and I just was just like... I don't feel good about watching children getting dragged into this shit show. And now she's in jail, and it's just like, I, I just kind of, I, I don't watch The Housewives, but my sister last night told me that Nene has a line of clothing on HSN, and Molly's like, you should do that. You know, she's like, you've got good taste, and I'm like, no, I don't. Like, somebody picked this out for me. Like, I didn't do that. But anyhow, so I, I do not, but my mom watches and my sister watches, so I sort of feel like I'm clued into that universe anyhow, connected to it, as it were. Um, I, I think I should, like, dismiss class now because, like, some of those, thank you guys so much. Thank you.